I'm not big enough to have sponsors yet, but this video is brought to you by the Epithet Erase Kickstarter, which is not paying me. After about two years of waiting, the series is finally getting a sequel through a crowdfunded novel and audiobook. The Kickstarter has already reached its goal and is now crushing stretch goals for stuff like music videos, more novels, plushes, and even a TTRPG. Go support the campaign if you like EE and want to see this stuff. If you looked around my channel at all, you'll notice almost everything I cover is indie. That's not by accident either, as I definitely have a bias towards the little guys. In the field of games, standout indies really are a breath of fresh air compared to what a lot of AAA has become. They end up being way more creative because they can afford to take these risks. You'll get weird experimental stuff like Outer Wilds, Disco Elysium, or Diaries of a Spaceport Janitor that end up being more investing, or at least memorable experiences than their AAA counterparts. They're just more fun to talk about than bigger titles, and they just manage to find their way into my heart as more than just a fun game. Though, while games are what I mostly focus on when it comes to indies, it's not the only place to find small creators trying to make something all their own. My praises for indies still ring true between mediums, as without big studios, creativity flies freely. This is where you'll find those passion projects with so much soul to them. Even if they don't have the same polish that bigger things might, they have so much more to them in every other aspect. It's hard to not respect the dedication and hard work all these people put into what they love. While they end up harder to find due to how these mediums are shared compared to games, there is still a wealth of incredible independent creations, whether it be films short and long, sketches, literature, or the topic of today, web series. Animated web stuff is in no short supply, as there are so many talented animators creating incredible projects online. The one catch is that due to how expensive and time-consuming this work is, you gotta wait a decently long time for it, and even then, it's mostly in the form of short films or pilots for what could be hopefully a bigger series with the help of a studio. You're not gonna see a full series produced independently. Or, well, you'd be right saying that only if you're going to be a stickler for what counts as animated. Because recently, I finally caved in and decided to check out something on my radar. A small animated web series called Epithet Erased. What's going on? You'll have to crunch and work till time till you die. Cut out the corners, cross the teeth and down the eyes. Whip out the white, I'm gonna keep it in good taste. Just so that no one will ever know it's defaced. Epithet Erased. Epithet Erased is an animated web series made by the YouTuber Jello Apocalypse, with the help of the streaming platform Verve. The show explores a world where some people are inscribed with a special power known as an epithet. This epithet is a series of magical abilities all based around the single word that is their epithet. These can range from normal powers such as barrier, to more complex like Sundial, to kinda stupid like Soup. But even the dumbest sounding epithet can end up proving very powerful through how one can interpret a word. In this world of Sweet Jazz City, we follow several characters through Molly Blindef and Percival King as our POVs, all in pursuit of an artifact known as the Arson Amulet, an amulet that is said to be able to steal someone's epithet from them. And once the amulet is stolen from a museum, it turns into a mess of several factions all trying to get their hands on it. Logically, hijinks ensue. The series was actually based on an old tabletop campaign Jello had previously run with the system of epithets, known as Anime Campaign. Though, you won't be able to find it now, as it was taken down due to basically being the plot of Epithet Erased, but just less cleaned up. The series ran for one seven episode season on both Verve and YouTube, before entering a long hiatus. This is mostly due to troubles that came during production, as the project kind of happened by surprise. Jello was left scrambling to quickly get a team together, make everything they needed for the project, and burnt through their savings trying to fund it. The series took a pause not only to recover from production, but also due to the fact that production couldn't be afforded or done like that again. If you want more details on it, Check out Daft Pina's video on the topic, 
it goes much more in depth and has some good insights by Jello. The series sadly remains mostly a cult classic, without even many knowing it exists. Though the show is absolutely beloved by most who do find it, aside from a few who critique the limited animation, it's highly praised for the wonderful premise of the world, a lovable cast of characters, and hilarious yet heartwarming writing. Now, before we dive more into the analysis of the show, I do want to say that it will be much more enjoyable if you've watched the show before seeing this video, as I do have to go into spoilers to discuss things. It's nothing to ruin it, but it's definitely got a few surprises in store and it's just fun to watch unfold. It's only 7 episodes on YouTube, about a 2 hour watch. Seriously, just go watch it. But without further ado, let's dive into the series and see what makes it so excellent. Epithet erased. Let's get this out of the way and talk about the elephant in the room. The main criticism that's given to this show by some. The animation. Epithet Erased doesn't have actual animation like other shows for the most part. Instead, it uses static character sprites that move about and change the show in motion, mixed with the top-down sections akin to a D&D &D game with tokens. This style is much like Jello's style they have for their YouTube videos, but much more polished and fleshed out. Now, some people ended up being very disappointed in this show for not being traditionally animated. The style for them ended up being too stale and cheap looking for them. I can definitely understand people's criticisms, as the style definitely brings down some aspects such as fight scenes, which could be more visually entertaining. As much as I'd love for it to be fully animated, the style was born mostly out of budget constraints. I think people who say, well they should have just taken longer to animate fully, really underestimate both the cost and how long animation takes. The few fully animated sections weren't cheap to include, as going to Jello, just one of them cost $14,000. Expand that to two hours and you've got a bankrupt creator. But, despite their limitations, the team worked their hardest to perfect the style they had to get every strength out of it. One thing limited animation usually leads to is inexpressive characters. It's so easy to just focus on getting it barely animated, and everything feels stiff without any big expressions or character to how they move. Epithet Erased instead managed to go the opposite direction, by sacrificing possibly very stilted cheap animation for expressive and wonderfully drawn character sprites. The main artist, Rhea Bertram, managed to create a really appealing style with this show. Each sprite for the characters is extremely expressive, with even the most basic giving off so much personality. This can mostly be credited to the art style in general, but not needing to worry about the actual pose to pose definitely allowed for more room for these to be polished to a shine. It also is a way they make up for the lack of actual emotion, as these big gestures and strong poses instead do the work to make these characters feel lively and in motion. This leads me straight to what is the most surprising thing to work with this visual style, the fight scenes. For a style like this, a fight scene should logically just feel like two action figures smacking against each other. But they managed to pull some creative tricks to make it still work here. The writing for these fight scenes overall does a lot of the heavy lifting, by making them not just simple boxing matches, but instead using abilities that are more easily represented with the limited animation. But even when they are more physical, they manage to pull it off with a mix between creative sprite motions and hiding bigger stuff that isn't fully animated behind the top-down style. This secondary style is actually genius, as it allows for these moments of very complicated movement to be represented more easily, but in a way that doesn't completely take away the impact or visual interest of it. It ends up being a really clever workaround for when they can't afford the sprites or just can't do it due to how the backgrounds work. The top-down style also allows for so much great visual humor with just the way the characters move about and express themselves here. It's just really great. But overall, the style does what it needs to in that it manages to always have enough going on to keep the viewer focused with its visuals. Even if it's not completely fluid like some people say it should be, it manages to work smarter to keep its visuals on honestly the same level as fully animated shows. Even if you aren't a fan of the stiff style, 
The show does have some excellent fully animated scenes for the big finale of its arcs. The animation here was outsourced to Powerhouse, the team behind stuff like the new He-Man and Netflix Castlevania, and they absolutely knock it out of the park with these scenes. They managed to both match the original style's charm, but the movement and camera work sell these big finishing moments perfectly. Not to mention their work in the OP, which is just so smooth and wonderful and perfect. This incredibly expressive style is completed by what is basically the backbone of the entire series, the voice acting talent. Considering the series is more writing focused than visually focused, it's a good thing that this aspect is able to absolutely sell the script writing here. Each member of the cast does amazing work in capturing our character at all times, pulling the full range of emotions effortlessly for some characters. So many hilarious jokes are just carried by how well the actors deliver their lines. I can't exactly put into words how great the performances are, but some real standout ones for me were definitely William T. Sop as Ramsey. Uh, he's a good kid. Too bad he's gonna get screwed. Danny Chambers as Molly. I bet I already stepped on a bunch of security lasers. I'm a criminal. It's all over. Well, time to turn myself in. And especially Don M. Bennett as Zora. Duels at dawn. Battles of destiny. Just two warriors giving it their all where the only deciding factor is pure old-fashioned skill. Is that why you dress up as a cowboy? Oh! Don't interrupt. Everyone brings their A-game for this project. On top of this are all the wonderful backgrounds that add so much life to the world of this show and just look lovely with their paint style but also the wonderful music made by Plasterbrain. This is one of those scores that you may not notice actively while watching, as it just blends into every scene perfectly. When you go to actually listen to it, it's a really great listen. There's a really good range of styles to fit every emotion, location, or character that they need to. It just does a perfect job of setting the tone for any given scene, especially standout moments like Mira's final fight, the clash against Zora, the bar fight, or the finale. But there's still music that stands out here with the incredible opening and credits themes, with Deadline, Great at Crime, and Great at Cowboy. I really don't know what to say other than these are just a blast and really nice to listen to. Now that we've covered what was actually the weakest aspect of this show, let's move into perhaps the most intriguing aspect, with the world and main plot. Epithet erased. Mine is barrier. As I said in the intro, Epithet Erased builds up quite the interesting role with Sweet Jazz City. Not so much in the actual world building of locations, but instead in the way that characters end up being connected, and most importantly, the system of epithets. As stated before, people in EE's universe are separated between the regular people known as Mundies and the inscribed who have these epithets. These epithets can be nearly anything, and will give the user a completely unique power set without many limitations on what powers it can have beyond the word in question. While it can sound very simple on the surface, that simplicity ends up being its greatest strength, as it allows for a lot of creativity with both what powers can be and how fights end up being structured. The system of words is very interesting, as due to how open some can be, it can allow for power sets that seem like they'd be utterly useless until they consider the other definitions or aspects of a word. Dumb seems like it wouldn't be great due to most people only considering the definition that deals with intelligence, but it blindsides us with also using the idea of dumbing down as part of the power set. Even within the definitions, what that meaning or thing actually does is super open too. Soup seems like it could be a joke power, but instead the way it's manifested turns it into something more, even if it's still kind of a joke. Power sets can vary wildly between straightforward offensive stuff, support for allies, using one's environment, setting up structures for various things, strange reality warping, or just a whole grab bag of wild things. You never know what you'll get from different characters even once you know their epithets. Not only does this create both a fun guessing game and a sense of variety between characters' abilities, it also changes up the ways fights end up working sometimes. While I love hard magic systems a lot, the rules and constraints can end up being limiting for what kind of fights there are. 
In these series, you can't just wildly shake up the entire meta on a whim to make the fight more fun. But that's exactly what Epithet does with its fights, as just by the nature of each one having such different abilities with their own roles, the way they're approached will also be different. Will it be a straightforward brawl? Do they need to expend some kind of resource? Is it going to be a chase or an unstoppable foe? It's almost like a puzzle to figure out their weakness. All of this depends on the enemy's epithets, and thus fights end up never feeling the same. That's not even mentioning just how fun these fights end up being in terms of just their general pacing and major set pieces that the powers allow for. There's a wonderful sense of flow and structure with getting through the mystery of what their epithet can do before figuring out a unique way to use their own to defeat them or get what they need. The system of epithets have often been compared to the stand system of JoJo's, and it's not an unfair comparison, as both are very soft magic systems where the abilities vary wildly between characters in order to change up how every fight works. They're both well loved for the creativity they allow for. But, in my opinion, I think the system of epithets has something over the stand system, and I think that lies in its one constraint and how it simplifies the system. While the abilities being able to be anything in JoJo's can make them very interesting and diverse, it can sometimes go too far. Some stands end up being too experimental or wild, end up either being hard to understand or barely connected in terms of powers and thus hard to follow. But epithets don't have this problem, as the powers always remain grounded thanks to their word. There's no need for long-winded explanations most of the time, because abilities have to be tied to simple words and thus both can't have too many specificities and also always have a reference point for what the power is. Just looking at someone's epithet can give you a decent idea of what their power will be most of the time. It's extremely open, but also stays easy to understand. Beyond being just a fun power system, epithets also lead to another standout part of the series, the overall plot and how it leads to fun world building. The plot initially seems quite simple with the museum arc, as a small group fights over a magical artifact called the Arsen Amulet. It's rather lighthearted and simple, until the amulet gets out of the museum, and the weight of stealing epithets is felt, as we see what kinds of people and groups get caught up in the chase. It ends up becoming, or at least seems to be becoming, a larger conflict between large factions, including the main baddies of Bliss Ocean, people out to get rid of epithets. This escalation of scale ends up working perfectly to introduce us to all the corners of this conflict at a manageable pace, instead of just overwhelming us by diving straight into the deep end. But beyond just being an interesting plot to see unfold and be fleshed out, the story structure has a unique advantage. The plot doesn't follow one singular character, as for season 1 it seems to hop around and follow the signature amulet as it switches hands from Molly, to the Bonsai Blasters, to Mira, and then to Percy and Bliss Ocean. It makes it the perfect vehicle for more character-focused stuff, as it can easily give us these small arcs just focus on a smaller group of characters with their own arcs, instead of focusing on just one member of the cast the whole way through. We'll get into this character-focused writing more when we get to that section, but it wouldn't be possible without this plot structure, or at least it wouldn't be pulled off nearly as well. And as said before, it also allows us to easily see different aspects of the world as it bounces between protagonists. The world of EE e. just has so much going on with it, from the tension between Mundies and Inscribed, to the way the world has changed to handling epithets existing, and the different factions that have risen up because of it. While it can feel a little like it at first, it most certainly isn't just our world with the magic slapped onto it. They consider the tiny ways it will change things, and just how people see the world. Because of that, the world building here works excellently. And all that work into both the world building and overall plot paid off in terms of creating intrigue, as people are left on the edge of their seats for what happens next with the series. But beyond the power system and plot, where Epithet Erase really shines is in the character and humor. So let's finally dive into that. Hey, Epithet Erased! Epithet Erase is a show carried by its incredible cast of characters. While the world itself is interesting and the plot is a fun ride, the characters are where both the real charm and depth lie. 
Each of these characters is written so perfectly. They all have a ton of personality and charm, really standing out from each other. Each is extremely distinct, as they all have a quirk to them that sort of defines their whole character. This leads to all of them having very bold and strong personalities. They give them a lot of screen presence and just makes them a blast to watch. Normally going with such exaggerated ideas for these characters would have the risk of leaving these characters feeling one dimensional, but the show manages to avoid that and instead twists things to turn all these characters into something you might not expect. A lot of characters in the cast take what your initial expectations about them might be and twist them wildly to create a much more interesting character than the initial trope. Some examples of this are a gang leader turning out to just be an edgy team with Giovanni, which dreams like the straight man lawful good turning out to still be lawful good but to a terrifying extent with Percy, and the criminal mastermind con artist just being a guy who wants to go home with Ramsey. All this combines to create a wildly varied cast, where no two characters ever feel quite the same. Everyone brings something wildly different to the table and makes things much more entertaining to watch. This especially shows when the characters interact with each other as this show has some outstanding character dynamics. With such bold personalities at play, the way they bounce off each other leads to absolutely incredible writing. The overall chemistry between these characters is just so good and the dialogues flow smooth as butter. It's mostly used for comedy with really great flow, but these dynamics can also lead to some really good emotional moments. Another thing these dynamics help elevate is the character arcs, as their personal development ends up intertwining with each other as the plot progresses, like with Molly, Giovanni, and Sylvie, Molly and Mira, or Percy and Ramsey. It ends up both making these characters feel more connected, and also just makes the overall structure better, as it keeps the viewer's attention with weaving through these different small plot lines like this. The character arcs are also really great on their own, as the cast has a surprising amount of depth given the mostly comedic tone of the series. They all have their own problems to deal with, their own ways of seeing the world no matter how flawed the view might be, and their own goals to achieve. The focal characters have some pretty good development, as they interact with each other and grow in interesting directions, from being less uptight to getting some backbone to themselves. No matter what direction they take, it's really fun to watch them change and develop like this. Though it is worth adding that not every character gets this level of depth and care. Some are more focused on their quirks and just being a riot to watch, with characters like Arnold and Indus. And oh boy, a riot they are to watch. Ooh! The dinosaur exhibit is my favorite! That is the exhibit with dinosaurs in it! He forms a small barrier the size of a donut in his hand and begins smacking it lightly against the tape like a caveman. The cast of characters that this show has is just so fun, and that's a key part of Epithet Erase's tone. Fun. The show doesn't take itself too seriously, outside of a few specific character moments, and instead leans hard into a comedy focus. And oh boy, the comedy of this show. Humor is always something that's a bit hard to break down and analyze, but with how much of a core component it is to the writing, I'll do my best. The show for me is an absolute comedic riot, as it constantly tries to squeeze jokes and humor out of nearly every line and moment it can, barring when it needs to get emotional or build tension, of course. And these jokes almost always hit their mark, as it made me and my friends laugh out loud several times while watching it. This is probably just because the show really does appeal to my own sense of humor, as it works off a good mix between the characters just bouncing off each other with great banter, and more high-octane moments of pure insanity and surrealism. It just has such a snappy pace with jokes always being thrown your way. One second it will be the delivery of lines, the next it will throw a slapstick at you. It can easily catch you off guard and just always keeps new jokes coming at you in ways you might not expect. This results in a show that is endlessly quotable with its jokes. Seriously, there's just so many incredible one-layers and out-of-context things that are still just hilarious to me. I'm not too great at explaining this still, so just have a few as an example. I can reload too, you know. I spit in his mouth. <laughs> Did that seriously just happen? Hello, this is the cops. Hi, I'd like to go to jail. Oh, have you never before supped upon pinted comb? He's consumed the debauchery! 
All this results in writing that's an excellent mix between comedic insanity and actually heartfelt stuff with characters who you can't help but become attached to. It's just a blast to watch in ways I really can't describe well here. But let's finally wrap all this up. Epithet erased. Despite the quality of the series and the partnership with Verve, it sadly remained a bit underground with only about a million views on YouTube for every episode but the first. This is likely due to just a lack of overall hype due to its scale and the animation style making people judge it by its cover. Considering the size of its creator and Verve itself, it's not too surprising that it didn't blow up like other online shows, but it still disappoints me a little bit especially with how much the creator gave in order to make it a reality. However, the series did manage to garner quite the passionate fanbase and became a cult classic among many who are eager to share the series with anyone who will listen. And despite the long hiatus the show took, it's finally returned to continue the story, although not in its original medium. A Kickstarter was made for Prison of Plastic, a novel that continues the main story of the series. Even if it's not the season 2 most fans wanted, it's still more epithet erased and is sure to be a blast when it's published. The Kickstarter has already been fully funded and way beyond, as it crushed the stretch goals it had for music, hardcover prints, novel adaptations of season 1, and more. It's still continuing to chug along towards big rewards like funding the sequel, getting a TTRPG rulebook tweaked and re-released, and even a full OVA. I may or may not have rushed out this video just to be able to say there's still a few days left in the campaign, so if you enjoy Epithet Race, please go give this Kickstarter your love. Either way, the amount of support this is being able to get is still incredible. Despite the rocky production of Season 1, and even though it's not an animated form, the future of Epithet Race seems to have been secured with this runaway success of the Kickstarter, and I couldn't be happier. Because even if it doesn't have pretty pictures and animation anymore, it's still the same incredible writing and just more of the series I fell in love with recently. I'm more than happy to take these books, even if we never get the rest of the series as a show. Independent creation is really hard. It's easy to see those runaway successes and think that anyone can do it like a breeze. But that's just wrong. Even small projects take so much time and effort to get done unless you have a studio to help. It's hard to just get something finished and up to quality out there, and that's why Iggy's production strikes a chord with me. It's a team that gave nearly everything to create what they did, and had to work with harsh limitations due to budget and time. Yet, what they made is one of my new favorite things ever, just due to the sheer passion put into it and the creativity of the team. And thanks to their hard work, we have a series that wouldn't be the way it is if it was taken by a big studio, or may not have had the chance to even be picked up. Something made with a creative voice unrestrained, where creativity and passion shine through so brightly. It's just inspiring for me as a creator to see, and I just can't wait to see the rest of it made so freely. Once again, I have to ask that if you enjoy EE, Please go support the Kickstarter to ensure the project's future and make it easier for the team to make. It's not easy to fund any kind of project, but with the love and support of fans, it gets a bit easier. Even if you don't have money to throw their way, just sharing the Kickstarter around is more than enough to help out. But that's all for now. See y'all in the next video, wherever that takes us.